Hi, I'm Wayne Miller, and um, I'm going to be reading uh, some poems um, from my book, We the Jury, which came out um, almost a year ago. And um, before I start, I want to uh, thank Rebecca Aronson for invi inviting me to read for Bad Mouth, which I'm very excited about. And um, I'm going to jump right in. I should say that uh, I'm hiding out in my little basement office while my kids are running around upstairs, so hopefully you won't hear any of that. Um, uh, okay, here I go. Uh, first poem, Generational. Open the bays and we fall together as in archival footage from last generation's war. We shift inside our tumbling, the air hitting us each a little differently. There's comfort in this collectivity. We'll land together more or less, our impacts giving off globes of light, becoming one light, soundless to the pilots, the bombardiers, wherever they've gone. Uh, this next poem I wrote um, after the Pulse shooting, and I read a newspaper article that talked about how um, when the first responders went into that um, absolutely horrific space, um, many of the people who had been killed, their cell phones um, were ringing in their pockets, and that struck me as, um, uh, well, just struck me. Um, this is called Carillon. Phones were ringing in the pockets of the living and the dead the living stepped carefully among. The whole still room was lit with sound like a switchboard, and those who could answer said hello. Then it was just the dead, the living trapped inside their clothes, ringing and ringing them. And this was the best image we had of what made us a nation. This one's in three brief sections. Little domestic elegies. One. When the backyard light came on, I was surprised to discover the air filled with snow so downy and silent it never quite reached the ground. When the light went out, all I could see was solid dark, still full of that snow. Two. On our first cold day in the new house, the clear world beyond us became fogged by the handprints of whoever had installed our windows. Three. Wind poured through the framed up house they were building next door, an emptiness like photographic paper, waiting for some not yet installed light to turn on and imprint the room it has now become. I'm now in the second half of my 40s, so um, I'm thinking uh, about um, the topic of this next poem, which is called Middle Age. It's in two sections. One. This body, which equals a life no more, no less, and thus is incomplete, even asleep, even watching TV, soon will rise to pee, to find itself in the mirror, examining what this body appears to be. And I was wrong, thinking time gathers inside me. I was wrong inside my body, moving through time. So that now I imagine a dot matrix print head growing a picture, each pass revealing one more line of body until the image is whole, and then some other body must come and dispose of it. 2. At my one-week follow-up appointment, I listened to the person who had opened for the first time ever my abdominal cavity, grown from nothing like the hollow of a pepper. I watched her fingers hold a plastic pen that marked on a pad her swoops of thought. The light around us had poured into my body, annihilating its darkness where no one lives. Um, okay, this next poem is, um, is about a dog. 
if I can find it. Um, here we go. Here we go. Um, it's about a dog and um, and a uh, Civil War reenactment. It's called The Reenactment. When the dog ran onto the field between the opposing lines of uniformed men, a few squat cannons, muskets cantilevered into the air, a boy chased it from among the colony of lawn chairs, t-shirts, and gym shoes that in that context represented a more fully comprehending vantage. And for a moment, the battle continued, muskets popping, men shouting period curses and commands, while the boy and his dog filled the smoke-hazed pitch with their chase, the leash trailing through grass, the boy calling buster, buster, until the guns slowed, then stopped, and a few soldiers broke from their sides to chase the dog, too, and then one of them trapped the leash beneath his boots, so the animal jerked to a halt, and the dog and child were led triumphantly from the battlefield toward the bright colors of the future where we all now were standing to receive them. Uh, this poem is in several sections, six, but they're all short sections. This is called Rain Study. Um, you'll find it has a lot of rain in it. Rain study. One. All night, the channeling of water in the gutters keeps tracing the outline of the house. Two. My son's face pressed to one side of the glass, the storm to the other. He's too young to understand why the trees swing around in nightmare mechanical motion, but the rain filling the air before him must have something to do with it. Each flash of lightning brings the present more sharply into the present. He turns back to our space inside it. Three. It was raining in the capital, and the nation's new delight, the war, was on. A thick fuzz of rain stood on its pen tips in every street. The awnings hung their empty rooms like diving bells inside that falling. Four. Again, my daughter is talking in her sleep, her language just water cycling through a fountain, and my son who can't yet speak. Endless rain. Five. Then my wife and I were alone in the house for the first time in months, a shocking quiet dampened further by the gray of rain. When the wind gusted, a drop sometimes landed in a square of the bedroom's window screen. Later, the scattered placement of water there offered a record of the afternoon. Six. On the undersurface of a raindrop as it falls, a fish-eyed reflection of the ground rising at tremendous speed, and that's it. Um, this is a little sonnet. It's called Invention of the Afterlife. When his friend's last notes and letters arrived in a heavy envelope, he found more than a hundred pages bound simply with a rubber band. For three hours, he dragged his mind through the strands of her tight cursive. He was surprised that he recognized almost none of the thoughts and events related there. He'd assumed he would, glean a, he would gain a clearer vision of her lost interior, but in the end, so little was revealed, he decided the reading had barely counted even as reading. It was more like combing her hair. Okay, here's the, the title poem of the book, um, which I wrote after uh, doing jury duty, um, after uh, sitting all day waiting to find out if I would end up on a jury. And this is about a jury that's tasked with the job of, um, uh, of judging its own innocence, judging itself, its own innocence or guilt. 
We, the jury, having heard the evidence against us, having taken into account the strength of every possible position, having gone home to our partners, our children, and having never mentioned the full details of our thoughts, having come to comprehend the wrongs of which we stand accused, having pledged to consider our omissions and our acts, we know that we will determine the facts, and those facts will become the surface upon which this world rests. We will assess the veracity of our witnessing against us. We understand our innocence could well require we find ourselves guilty. And when at last the verdict arrives, we will come down upon us with the weight of our entire existence. Even then, not one of us will truly understand what we have done. Here's another sonnet. Uh, this poem, you can either read it as a, you know, a poem about, um, what, about family and, um, and uh, family members, I, a family member I have, or you can read it as a political poem. You can kind of go either way. This is called The Narcissist. Our boats on the black water and the lighthouse swinging its gaze around, its beam reaching and withdrawing, reaching and withdrawing. It seemed the whole sea rose up to that towering eye. It seemed as though it had the power to draw us from our shadows, to lure us toward the rocks the waves were breaking hard against. What would we do if we got there? But we were farther away than we'd supposed. And when that blaze of light slid briefly across us, it only served to show us to each other. And I'm going to uh, end with a, a poem. It's in three relatively short sections. Um, and um, uh, this this poem is about the like the super rich. Um, but to write about them, I had to um, kill them. So. Um, so this is in their voice, but they're speaking from the afterlife. This is called From the Afterlife of the Rich. One. We were rich. In the valley below, the highway formed a pave river, and down in the orchestra pit, the musicians were clothed in our sustaining contributions. Our portfolios swelled and contracted inside digital rib cages, and that silent breathing was the breathing of a spirit that's beyond you. When we left, our houses filled with security, mute and clear like still water. When we returned, that presence withdrew into our secret codes. All summer long, a mist rose off our lawns. I'm sure you'd say like steam resurfacing from a buried 19th century. It was recycled water on a timer for the grass. Two, we were the rich. We glimpsed the poor smoking dumbly on their stoops, lugging gas cans to their drained vehicles. We filled their televisions as though we were fictional characters. We recalled their revolutionary songs. We could see them covet our luxury hybrids. They looked up to us, you know, with the blankness of a field of tiny flowers. When they agitated, it was like a breeze out of nowhere passed across their surface. That trembling was lovely when observed from a distance. In a minute, it would stop. Three. But our lives, too, were visited by elemental tragedies, deaths of parents, illnesses of children, fires that absolutely failed to light. Poet, with your minuscule economy, simply no one understands. I know what you'll say. Your art was there for us, and yes, it was. More important. In those moments of terror and empty, useless grief, our primary need was sympathy, real sympathy, which we, like all the living, deserved. Thank you for listening, and uh, uh, thank you again. Thanks. Bye-bye.